What's up, y'all? This is Jesse Warden. Tonight, we're going to go over the Robot Legs example project, Cafe Townsend, to actually show you some code, right? I did a long presentation with little slides, and I was dressed up in a suit and looked all nice. But I'm actually showing you real code tonight. We're actually going to go through the guts of the example application. So you can see the Lua code, you can see the Robot Legs implementations, and some of the various ways we can implement implement the various patterns that uh, Robot Legs does. So, if you go to github.com slash Jester Excel, you can find a variety of my projects. One of them that you should note is the Robot Legs for Corona. It is all you need to actually get started in Corona um, SDK using Robot Legs and VCS. But what we're interested in this evening is the examples folder. And inside are two projects, the Basic and the Cafe Townsend. Now, still in development, having a significant amount of fun trying to figure out native text fields for PC versus Mac simulator, yada, yada. Um, I believe it doesn't work on the PC Mac simulator, so that's why you can't click on the username and pass field, <clears throat> password fields when you're using the simulator on Mac or PC. So if you're using a Mac, you should be good to go, okay? Or you can just watch this video if you're on a Windows machine. So what we're interested in is checking out this example. There's code and design. All right, so as you can see, the phone and the tablet design are different based on different resolutions, right? Same application, but different resolutions. This goes back to the responsive design when you're thinking about dealing with universal binaries, specifically for iPhone, but this can also apply to Android development as well. Um, for the most part, you're having a design that responds to this device size it is on. And that doesn't just mean if your iPad's rotated or not, but it also means screen size. The iPad uh, 1 and 2 have significantly larger resolution than even the iPhone 4 and 5. So you design a responsive design around that. So as you can see, we have a uh, login screen and employee screen for law, the actual phone. And I'll turn off that uh, layer for you so you can actually see the employee view. Right, so it's very similar to what we have on the left screen, but it's a completely separate view for the actually edit screen for viewing employees. Whereas the iPad has a large enough screen real estate if your config Lua is set to that size. And we'll get to that later in a future uh, video to talk about screen sizes and config Lua and all the insanity around that with regards to universal binaries. It's pretty confusing. But for now, just know I build my GUI once using robot legs for different screen resolutions and it adapts to whatever screen size it is. So all that work has nothing to do with robot legs beyond the mediator. It has to do with you building a GUI that can scale or be responsive to whatever screen size it's on, right? Single code base, responsive design. So that's that. Now we're going to use the iPhone 4. I'm not at home, I'm actually in New York uh, on a client site visit. So I'm going to have to use my smaller Mac monitor. I apologize for that. But as you can see, it will work because I can use native text fields on a Mac. So we're going to type in the username and password, which is, it doesn't actually connect to a server, it's fake, right? Admin and password. We hit login. It'll go to the login state, show the login and getting the employees. We can scroll through this uh, tablet view here, or we can click on a particular employee, see their information, modify it if we'd like, Abraham with 20 billion M's, hit save, go back, you can see it's there. You can also delete Abraham. Are you sure you want to delete? Absolutely. It'll delete that employee from the model, redraw the list, and good to go, right? So pretty simple application, but indicative of, of larger applications that you would build. Uh, utilizing some form of MVC to handle but what your view seeing, the gestures of you actually clicking on it, your users clicking on it, and dealing with the model and actually handling that um, actual interaction with the data living on the device in RAM, as well as the servers that interact with your server or core data locally, up to you. Um, you can add, obviously, you're going to have to code your own core data, right? So you can interact with the server and, and modify the data, okay? And then log off finally goes back here. And one last thing is you can filter the real time data. Uh, using the actual data from the model to filter for J, right, for example. And as you can see on the new user screen, say Jesse Warden, that's me. And I can choose a picture, however, I'm still <laughs> working on the masking. So don't make fun of my horrible picture mask. But anyway, that's the, um, that's the concept. You hit save, save to the server, and filter by J again, or you can just see down here, see the picture I just created. Oh, better picture. There we go. Not the picture I chose either. And I'll get to what that is. But as you can see, pretty simple application, right? So this is the kind of app you would build in Robot Legs uh, from a larger scale. You divide multiple views to different people. And you still have a single view with multiple um, actual resolutions. So let's show you an example. We'll do an iPad 
upright first, okay? So we'll do admin, do password, okay? Notice uh, it's unfortunately the config Lua is not dynamic, so it'll still be the same size. That's why everything is really, really large instead of taking advantage of the iPad's significantly larger amount of pixels. But what we can do is when you click on a person and go back, we can rotate it. So let's rotate it. And as you can see, it'll switch views, right? So it's smart enough to know that it has more room. It'll actually throw the thumbnails in the uh, employee list here. All right, we can actually click on different people and see them off to the right with more detailed information. Um, you'll notice edit is now an actual state or a different view we go to rather than a single separate view that slides in on the iPhone because you have more room. So we click edit. We have the same view as before, which could be dressed up or completely separate. Uh, maybe take advantage more of the real estate, but it's pretty much the same functionality, right? So it helps reuse code and everything else. And we go back to the actual uh, GUI itself. So that is an example of the actual app. So let's go in and, and talk about some of these views, okay? First thing is first, good old main. So let's take out all of this test code so I can show you. Main has something special that it does. A normal local bootstrap function that's called here. Why is it wrapped in start this mug? Well, unhandled error. We wait 100 milliseconds to make sure that we have a registered error handle for on error. You return true during production code, you return false or nothing during non-production code, so you can see all the errors that come up and get annoyed by those pop-ups in current SDK because your code is pathetic. Right? That's what it's really for. So you wrap this uh, function in here so it can be the errors can be captured and you, you do it immediately. If you do it immediately, this function wouldn't be registered and it might not catch uh, errors in the stack, right? So that's the only thing it does. But you'll notice, um, take this global function show props away, we only have really two globals, right? We have our stage, which I've just hard-coded, and we have an, our app. That's it. We just have an application that we instantiate. So it's all magic. How does that app build our entire app? Well, let's go take a look. The Cafe Townsend, nope, app location. Cafe Townsend application. You'll notice that it is actually at the top here. It's not in any packages, okay? So Cafe Townsend does a few things that are important. Number one, it follows the Robot Legs View standard of class type, which implies that it has a mediator. Uh, number two, the init method is called to instantiate everything. So the background, uh, handling stage taps, if you want to do mouse up outside or tap up outside, right? We'll listen for that in the background. But most importantly, we instantiate our robot legs context in the application. So somebody somewhere has to instantiate the context. Could be your main app, could be your main application holder, right? That kind of acts as a controller and bootstrap. Um, could be whatever else. This is the way I've chosen to do it, not necessarily the best. But whatever. Notice that once the context is instantiated, I call init to make sure all the mediators, commands, and everything are wired up. And I instantiate the loading view, which is kind of like that thing that says loading. It shows and hides based on background processes. If you don't remember, I'll show you again. We'll log off, go to admin password, and you'll see a loading animation. That is the loading view, which takes an arbitrary piece of text inside of it, fades in and out, so it's always around. I don't want to get rid of it. I don't want to do object pulling, yada, yada, so I kept it around. That was my choice. You can do it differently. The orientation. This is the main guy who's really interested in changing what particular views. Now, he only has one view that he changes based on orientation. That's employee view with a list or employee view with the list and then the details on the right side. Make sense? So that's how he responds to it. And um, lastly, the other second robot legs convention for views, dispatching on robot legs view created with the target of self. So dispatching this and having this class type, assuming you have a mediator created, the context will take care of everything else for you for registering a mediator. We'll get to him in a minute, what he looks like. So all we're concerned about for this main view is show view. He is a basically a stack. He shows a bunch of views one at a time, right? He knows what the current last view was, calls the convention destroy method, very similar to the storyboard API, which loads and unloads things based on certain criteria. Mine, if it's going away, calls destroy and nails it out. It's pretty straightforward. There is no option to keep it around in view. We use a string-based switch statement. So if I want to show login view, I know to instantiate the login view class. If you instantiate the employee view or employee view large, I know to instantiate those particular classes based on the last known orientation. 
which is different when you boot up the app as compared to when you actually get the rotation orientation event. Uh, we hard code it, whatever it is. And finally, the last thing, once we have a current view of whatever that class is that it's showing based on where we're at, it brings the loading view or that little spinning animation that blocks touches while it's loading to the front, right? That's it. That's all it does. The orientation just does a little bit of magic to basically do some remeasurement on the background as well as to change the employee view large to employee view based on if you're rotated to port or portrait mode or not, right? That's about it, okay? Normal view stuff. However, the mediator is where all the robot legs magic happens. So let's take a look at him. Uh, the Captain Towns and Application Mediator. The reason I use this naming convention of view and view mediator or application application mediator. So when I'm in Sublime, I can quickly fall into related classes, right? So as you can see, it's about one or two email clicks away. So these are what I would like to call, upon register, um, application consistent events or events that have to do with application logic that really don't have anything to do with the server. So for example, when the user successfully logs in, I need to react to it. This Cafe Townsend needs to orchestrate something to happen. That is, cool, we're logged in, go ahead and show the employee view, right? That's where we're supposed to be. It doesn't actually tell the employee to load anything. It doesn't do anything like that. It's assumed that that view will take care of all that it needs to handle, right? So it keeps the code simple, easy to read, and basically defaults this uh, Cafe Townsend application to just show different views based on what its mediator tells it to, right? So the view is dumb. It says, I have a show view method, show view method and I'll show whatever views you want. The mediator is the one who listens to the global application events and robot legs and responds to those things, right? So the mediator is the bridge or gateway to the framework. He basically listens to those events and acts upon the API that the view exposes. In this case, show view. That's it, really pretty simple. Uh, it does some nasty things like, um, it creates uh, a new employee when you click the new employee button. It's a temporary uh, value object that allows you to edit it and then hit save. This kind of stuff is usually done in a model or a command, you know, controller-based logic. But considering, you know, the mediator is somewhat of a controller sometimes, <laughs> um, and this is a demo application, this is kind of a here on purpose. I want to show you that if you're in a hurry, you can do this kind of stuff. You can directly um, edit models. Assuming your model has a good API, it's okay for mediators to do this because it's easier to debug when something goes wrong. The problem with setting properties in Lua is that it's very difficult to get a stack trace unless you're using meta tables that actually creates getters and setters. If you're just setting properties, it's very difficult to know who set your current employee to nil if it's done everywhere, right? So this is why I encourage your models to actually have APIs or methods uh, if you're using something like Lua, okay? So that is the Cafe Townsend Application Mediator. Notice there is no on remove. I am a slack bastard. I do not clean up my mess because it's assumed that you will never unload the application, which is not necessarily true. If you're creating this application as a module for others to utilize in a business app, you would definitely want to add, add that kind of cleanup stuff. So another bad thing. Uh, lastly, as soon as he instantiated, he calls the login view or kind of like says, all right, this is the first time loading. I want to start in the login view, right? So again, the view is not responsible for that. The view plays dumb. It allows somebody else or the mediator or his presenter, as you, if you will, to basically dictate where he should be. What is his initial state? This could be actually based on a, a model. Maybe this the cafe tension application goes away. And when you suspend your phone or turn your phone off, turn back on, it wants you to default in the deploy edit view of the last employee you're editing based on what it saved to the SQLite, which it hasn't saved to the server yet, right? Things can get really complex, but this uh, line of code could, could handle what is the last state, right? And you won't have to change much. So that is the Cafe Townsend Application Meter. So let's look at Login View, right? That first view that it actually shows. So Login View is like any other view. It's dumb. It just shows a bunch of uh, text. Auto Size Text just allows me to do text measurement. Um, so I can, you know, create a text field, but actually exactly position where it needs to go. I don't just got text growing. I can actually fit it on screen and actually get accurate measurement. So that's all it is. Same thing as a, a display text, just with a little bit more help. The background is the black thing that uh, surrounds uh, the username and password right here. And all the buttons and password fields and all the other stuff get created and instantiated inside. Now, two things. Number one, class type, login view, right? Number three, or number two, just kidding. Robot legs view created. Now again, you're wondering, okay, this we have a login view registered mediator, perhaps? Yes, we do. As you can see, login view mediator is right there. Now, if you remember, 
just to refresh your memory if you're new to robot legs, robot legs expects the context, something to wire up all those things together, right? Well, I've created a Caffin Cafe Townsend context. Now, you're more than welcome to create a context and manually add it yourself. You don't have to do inheritance if you don't want to, and that's fine. It's just an option. I like doing inheritance because I'm from an OOP background. That's where I grew up. You don't have to. So I inherit the robot likes context. I extend it by creating a new. I add an init method, which is not required. I just like it. It's a convention. And it's assumed that somebody outside of me will call the init method, but another common thing I'll do is context that init and call it myself. For now, I don't. So you can see the login view has a login view mediator, right? It's mapped to the package. All I have to provide is the actual class name of login view because it's assumed that we're not using the Lua 5.1 packages to actually look up package names paths, not to mention the fact that classes that are stuck in packages don't actually have access to their class path. I hope you caught all that. If you didn't, don't worry about it. Just know class type equals my class name, and you register the mediator with its full package path here. You use that login view is registered to mediator's login view mediator, right? So when this guy is instantiated, added to the actual screen, its mediator is created for it by robot legs. When it's removed by the Cafe Townsend application, right? Remember, show view. What is the first thing it does? If we have a view, get rid of it, right? Destroy it. Its destroy function will, what? That's right. Robot legs view destroyed. Get rid of itself. Robot legs will handle and get rid of the mediator, call the arm remove, and then you are free to clean yourself up. Okay, so the login view meter actually does that. It has an on remove, right? It removes the on listener handling, removes the runtime listener handling, and at that point, robot legs is done. Let's the view clean itself up. All the login view is really interested in at in this point is when the user gesture of on login is clicked. We're not really sure what that is. Maybe it's a touch, maybe it's a swipe. It doesn't really matter. The mediator just knows the contract that it's working with its view is events, right? So it calls methods on the view and it listens for events from the view. For now, I've decided to use on login. I want to know when the user clicks it. Most importantly, on login error actually comes from the login service. So I need to know that if we get a login error, that must have mean that somebody somewhere has dispatched an error, and it's my responsibility as the login view to show that error, right? So I provided a red text field below that can show that, okay? So if you look at uh, on login error, the actual response, I'll show you what that is. First off, let's look at login real quick. So when you log in, I snag the username and password from the view. <clears throat> now you're, you're, you'll notice he does a little bit of checking here. <clears throat> Rather than waste everyone's time sending null pointers or whatever else, he keeps the view dumb. Instead of the view being responsible for validate that the text field actually has text in it, that the user actually typed in a password and didn't just hit enter, right? The mediator kind of handles that. Now you don't have to do this route. You could actually um, you know, create a presenter to do that you could do that in the view. You know, it's really up to you, but I just want to show you an example of sometimes mediators can help offload a lot of that logic and keep your views really stupid. Because if you were to create another login view that was larger for a different device, maybe it looks different, maybe it acts different, whatever, but it still has the same need to sanitize inputs and if not, show an error to the user, right? Finally, lastly, it sends the application event of login with the packet or package inside that event of a username and password. Somebody somewhere is going to listen for this login and actually attempt to log into the server. All they need to do that is the username and password, right? So that's why that application uh, event is there. We don't know if that works or that ever comes back. We just know when the user presses, that's what happens. Our job is done. So let's look at those two errors that we are responsible for on login error and view error, right? Those are the two methods that you'll notice that we actually call. The login view dispatch login when we click the button will snag the email and uh, username and password from that and dispatch the on login event, right, as a self or view based event. But if somebody calls error externally, he knows to take that error message and put it inside the error label, which is a text field. It's, I follow the convention of uh, a few other SDKs where if you send some valid text into it, it'll actually show the text field, right, and show it in red and show the error. If you send a nil or null or nothing, It'll actually hide it, right? So visible equals false. This is the convention to turn on and off error text fields, okay? We have a little trickery for show text fields, which deals with native text fields. You'll notice up here at the top, uh, I had to use, unfortunately, input text. And input text is a wrap around a native text field. If you're not aware, native text fields do not, again, work on the Windows simulator. Number two, they cannot be put in groups. So they have to be mapped 
every time you move them to your local coordinate system. So if I move the login view and center it in the screen, the input text fields have to be centered and mapped to my coordinates, right? The API to do that is move. Sets the current group and then says, all right, now let's handle the native text fields, right? So it's important to know that when you're going from screen to screen, the native text fields uh, you know, have to be shown or hidden, whatever else. I wanted to give that ability so when you hit login and you're waiting to see if it works, you haven't actually left the login screen yet, right? But you don't want those text fields to be there on front of your loading screen to be clickable. So I hide them. It's just a utility method to work around the strange of Corona's ability to blend native controls with Corona Canvas controls, okay? So that is our login view, responds to user input. All it cares about is if you are typing in the fields and you hit enter, it considers that a submit rather than actually touching the button, right? So two ways to do it. You can type admin and password and hit enter, or you can hit submit. At the end of the day, the login meter just gets the login uh, event and handles it and dispatches the login. So what is the workflow here? We've got a mediator that a uh, view that's dumb, that has some controls, that can dispatch a login event and display errors. We've got a mediator that says, all right, when you click on it, I'll handle telling the framework about it. If I get an error from the framework, I'll inform you with an error message that you can show. But uh, who handles this login? Where does that happen? Well, let's follow the trail. So we'll go to context view. That's our first stop to guess. And lo and behold, we have a login message that runs a login command. Now, you are more than uh, capable of instantiating service inside your mediator, calling a login. And if it works, telling your login view, hey, it's good to go, right? <clears throat> or you can use a command to orchestrate that service call as well as, hey, letting the world know that the login was successful. So, for example, just because your web service logged the user in doesn't mean there might be some other things you need to do. So, for example, uh, I run a uh, website for my customer which allows users to log in but they not, might not be actually registered for the service yet. There's a third party set of affiliates that we support so we need to make sure that hey hey you can't use this until you actually register first. So you're more than welcome to browse content but you can't actually view it until you play. That is application logic. It has nothing to do with the user being successfully logged in. It's how the app works on the client. It needs to be given an opportunity to do that when the user comes back, right? So command can help orchestrate all of that application logic and we know where it goes. So it can handle both the service, the actual business logic and orchestrating that as well as all right, let's, are we supposed to do anything when the user logs in, right? That's where that would go. So let's look at the login command. When we dispatch login on runtime, it'll actually instantiate this command and run it. Run it also known as the execute function. Right, convention for commands and robot legs. So he instantiates the login web service, listens for the two events, right? Jesse Warden's common API of did it work or didn't it? Don't really care about progress events because I'm not showing progress bars for HTTP requests or REST requests. Thank you. I send it the username and password and I wait for a response. Praying that garbage collection doesn't eat me because I haven't worked through that yet. <laughs> but assume it doesn't. We have a login error or we have a login success, right? One of the two. If it is a login error, then we say, tell the framework, hey, we got an error and here's what it said. If we get a success, we still dispatch an error message just in case. Maybe the user needs to register or whatever else, right? But the point is that the application or robot legs and anyone and their mom who's listening to runtime, which is everyone in Corona, right? Because runtime is the global event bus. If you're familiar with the Flash Player API, it is this.loaderinfo.stage.sharedevents. It's a very similar thing, right? If you use that, then anybody, you know, gets a chance to react to it. So who reacts to this? Well, if you recall, login view listens for that in his mediator. If we get a login error, we actually show that error in the view, right? We don't have to, it's an option. Again, events are opt-in, right? It helps allow views to talk in an encapsulated way. The views can be encapsulated, send messages, and others can opt in to hear them. So they're not necessarily tightly coupled to that event, but it's kind of known if we change login error, this would stop working, we'd have to have a unit test, yada, yada, right? But it still is flexible. We could change the way this works and still someday, some, you know, whatever, listen to the login error event, okay? The challenge with this goes back to the, does the service retain the fact that it failed? And if so, does it retain the error? What if the login view was shown after, you know, for whatever reason, the user last tried to log in and we show the error? Well, no. 
So you get into some strange race conditions, but I'm not going to really cover that, but just something to be aware of, okay? So let's assume that we logged in successfully. You typed in admin and password into the field. Well, how does that work exactly? Well, this is not a real login service, okay? I added some code to make it look as such, but you'll notice it actually uses a timer that lasts for two seconds. Rather than actually um, call the success or failure JSON, it actually just runs a timer, okay? And after two seconds, it calls a timer. If it's successful, it loads this JSON, which is locally. It's not a real web server, okay? This is a typical login success or login error response JSON that I would receive from uh, two of the projects I actually work on where we deal with JSON, right? Uh, some of the older ones work in XML, but JSON is so much easier to deal with. And in Corona, you have native parsing, right? The login success JSON is usually what our server would send back. And if you want to see it, you can look in your, um, where did I put this? Think servers, mocks, or mocks data. So login success JSON is a packet of JSON I would get back as a string, right? I'd have to convert it to a Lua table. I would query the success variable and say, did it work? If so, great. It would give me back my user object. If it didn't, it would say success false, and it would give me an actual error message, right? Now, obviously, you want additional parsing and unit tests around this to verify you even got a valid JSON packet back versus like an HTTP 500 with pukes a web page or an Apache error or whatever, right? But it's known for now that this login service is pretty simple, and that's what she does, okay? She gets one of these two. Then we read the local file, parse it on the JSON, and say, all right, the network uh, request, you know, ended, yada, yada. So I'm kind of mocking a network request, right? You could switch out a real network request right here, right, using the networking API. If you had a server you wanted to test this against, you could comment this out. Uh, I'm sorry, uncomment this. And then um, you could take out all the mock stuff, and it would actually be a real server request, right? Then you'd query the event response. Did you actually get JSON? If so, query it. It was a success, great. Did you get an error message? If so, parse it. Otherwise, I can't parse it. I don't know what the heck I got. Otherwise, dude, I don't even know what the response was. In both cases, dispatch an error, right? This is a good service class. It handles all that weird business logic of actually talking to your server and getting useful data back. All we want to know is, did I log in? And if so, did I get a user? Thank you, right? And it'll do that via a login success. If not, it'll give us the error message and anybody and their mom and the robot likes framework can do it. Now, You'll notice I'm using self-dispatch, not runtime dispatch. And this is up for debate. Do you want your service classes to kind of act like models in that they dispatch business application events such as login success or errors and let the framework handle if it should care about it or not? Or do you want an intermediary such as a command to really interpret what does a login success really mean? Right? For now, it's one line of code that said, yeah, well, I'm just going to redispatch a runtime, that login success. But what if the user hasn't registered yet? Right? These, this is your opportunity to do it. This command is currently 29 lines of code. It could very easily get to 100 lines of code very quickly just to encapsulate that business logic, or in this case, application logic around the business logic of handling the login success. You got it? I know it seems like a lot, but that's, again, these are where you lay the groundwork with some of these commands you know are coming, and they expand nicely, and they stay encapsulated in the, that application logic layer, that controller layer, okay? So that's really what the, the login command does. So assuming it dispatches a login success, and we've logged in, now what happens? Well, let's go find out. Let's do a search for login success. Wow, a lot of people care about it, huh? Well, rather than do a global search, let's look in the obvious place, the context, which orchestrates know what those kind of things happen nothing in here so it must mean that somebody somewhere orchestrates a login success change the most obvious place to look next would be the Captain Townsend application or his mediator right login success if we are successfully logged in go ahead and show the employee view fascinating there we go so let's go look at the employee view. the employee view is just like any other view it is a group which throws a bunch of things in it internally a background some text the push button for the log off button and the new button in the top right, the pretty little headers, the search filter bar, right, that allows you to type in and filter things. When you hit enter, we can clear it out. And most importantly, the employee list. This is just a wrapper class around that little table view you saw with different you know, images and stuff. And um, you listen to when you view an employee, okay? So when you click on it and you want to actually you know, know that you clicked on uh, a particular employee. Notice that this particular implementation listens for that event and redispatches it, right? So it treats it as 
employee view dispatched the on view employee event. This is strictly for the mediator, so he can listen for that view. That's all basically we're event bubbling. Does that make sense? So we want the mediator to know that they clicked on an employee. But because it's our child, that event's gonna stop here. So we're redispatching it to bubble it up again. Okay? Again, view instead of self. We also are curious about orientation because he can draw differently based on different orientations on a phone versus a tablet. Okay? We're not gonna really get into this, but he can. And as any of you that needs to have a mediator, a robot likes view created is done last. And the class type ensures that our employee view is wired up in our, that's right, context. So let's look at our context again. Where's our context? Thing? Oh, there it is. Look for employee view. And there you go. Employee view is wired up to the employee view mediator. Notice the employee view large has the same mediator. That's right. We're using the mediator to have a contract or convention with the view to have the same API. It's just a view that draws completely differently but expects the same data, right? Works on a different device, maybe a different set of devices, tablets versus phones, you know, whatever convention you want to use for that, okay? For now, we're just interested in the employee view who draws a list and um, resizes himself based on the orientation change. Resize just resizes everything and handles the fact that some are native controls. Search as a native text input. Notice I have to call the move function to make sure that it's remapped, right? So again, it's a bunch of view stuff. I'm just dispatching events when users click on buttons, right? They either log off. If uh, somebody types search, I wire that up to filter the local list, right? No need for robot likes for that. I'm just taking data that's in RAM and filtering it. So hey, set your uh, current search based on this particular search filter that I have. Um, I'm expecting a table or list or array collection or collection or whatever you want to call it, a list of models, a list of VOs, right? That I'm actually going to display. In this case, those VOs or domain objects are employees, right? I'm going to show those in there. So as soon as I get the employees, I store a local reference and I say, hey, list, I got some employees. Go ahead and draw them, right? And that's the list job. It's a table view that takes employees, iterates through them, and displays them with the relevant data. If you click on them, it lets you know which employee you clicked on, right? And finally, destroy. It has some custom methods for destroyed. Um, because I'm dealing with custom components, I call it a destroy method rather than remove self because they have to do way more than just remove self. They have to remove event listeners, get rid of um, native um, native text fields, things like that, right? So destroy gives us a convention or opportunity to do so. And then just to be uber paranoid when I null out my internal reference. Obviously, you don't have to. Mark and Sweep will handle that, but it's good practice, right? And remove self on myself, Okay. That's the employee view. So a dumb view that displays a list of employees. What does the employee view mediator do? Let's, let's actually look at that guy. First thing is he listens for the model change. Now we haven't talked about models. Models are usually what drive the app, right? They're the core API on our data. Sometimes they can extract the services or you can put the service inside of the command like we did. If you put a service inside of a model, kind of like backbones people sometimes do, they'll actually put Ajax calls inside of there. That's usually known as... Um, or an abuse of the term of proxy, right? It's a proxy to your data. So it'll have data, but it's gonna go ahead and underneath get your data from the server and then give it to you. So you have the API of actually getting it, right? So that's why they call it a proxy versus a model. So the proxy design pattern. But, you know, apples and oranges, whatever. The point is, anytime the employee model changes, we wanna know about it because we gotta redraw our list. So regardless of who changed it, us, someone else, right? The server, it's polling for real-time data, or maybe somebody else deleted it, right? You're doing a multi-user uh, editing app. We need to know so we can redraw our list, okay? We want to know when you clicked on a particular employee from the view. We also want to know when the user clicked the log off button, as well as the new employee. Now, here is the setup code that the mediator does. And this is what mediators are great for. You can guarantee whenever you drop a view on stage, he'll handle actually wiring himself into the framework and go, okay, the view is ready. Let me get what data he needs, if anything. In this case, if the model data is in fact loaded from the server, cool, go ahead and set it, right? We have a, a, a notice I put G employees model, that implies it's global, right? It's just a convention to designate global variables versus not. Uh, Some data this will be actually dependency injection and an instance-based thing with the option of making singleton, so you don't have to put things on global. But, uh, you know, the Lua 5.1 versus 5.2 kind of puts a weird kink in things. So for now, we'll just call it a global model, okay? It has a employee's collection. We'll set that in there in the view. Otherwise, we'll wait for the, um, the employees to load. You're probably wondering, why do I have this uh, if-then statement here? Well, the first time you go there, 
I don't actually have the, the data in the model cached, right? It hasn't loaded from the server yet. You don't have the freshest data. When you come back to this view by hitting the back button, actually viewing an employees or whatever else, you've logged off, you basically have some data that's good for a few minutes. So you just go ahead and set it. The, the, the model's already loaded, right? So this loaded uh, property lets you know that otherwise you need to go ahead and unload employees. It lets the application know it's supposed to launch the event to, to actually get those guys going. So we can take a look at that. What does this uh, unload employees method do? Now notice, as usual, our loading view mediator has the ability to do that. So let's look at that guy. When he gets the onload employees and a variety of other events, he knows to show himself via is visible true, show the particular actual uh, GUI and the, sh the reason show is different than visible it actually fades it in and finally take an arbi arbitrary piece of text and show it in there such as loading employees or deleting employee right these are um, something you show the user to let them know the app is doing something it's just actually you know calling the server for something versus the little spinny thing in the iPhone and Android right now you'll notice it already loads it to true right this is uh, because the internally the employees model I'll show you the employees model um, I already set the data hard-coded in the init method, but I leave the loaded false. So that way you can see what happens when a view doesn't have its data ready, and the view should be able to handle nil. That's right, no nil, don't draw the table view, don't give, you know, don't blow up because you don't have your data yet. You still show the user something, right? The loading view says, oh, I'll go ahead and load in the data, right? When it's done loading, you can access this um, employees table, which as you can see is set with a bunch of fake uh, VOs or, or domain objects right here, okay? And when it's ready, it sets the employees, right? Then it dispatches this. This method, again, is the mediator for the loading view that listens to all kinds of loading events to know to hide it. So just to show you, the loading view mediator, responsible for reacting to application level events, mainly server, event, server events that you know load data. He knows to, oh, okay, just don't show the view anymore, right? Hide it, fade it away, whatever else. We're done loading, okay? So this is where you can interact with service events, whatever else. But again, a mediator can actually dispatch a event that others can listen to for a variety of purposes, to load data, whatever else, okay? So once the employee view is loaded in and we've got our employees and we can draw it in that list, we're good to go, right? What happens when you leave? Well, you want to get rid of your event listeners. That's it. The mediator's gone at that point. So what happens if the employee view does, in fact, change at a later date? Well, he'll actually set the employees again, which triggers an internal redraw. Now, obviously, that's not very efficient. Most models have uh, change events that say, oh, I removed item 5, or I replaced uh, item 6, or I added a new item at the end of the list, right? So you can more effectively redraw efficiently, right, rather than having to redraw the entire list. This is a demo app, so I take the shotgun approach, destroy the entire list, and draw again, right? Not the most efficient way to redraw, but... It is what it is. So, what are the user gestures that we actually have to handle? There's three. When you click on an employee, you dispatch, hey, the user would like to edit the particular employee they clicked on, and we'll pass that employee in an event. Don't care who gets it, just all they need to know is, hey, this event is what I'm caring about, and I need to know what employee you're talking about when you'd like to edit the employee. I need to know, right? So we can put him in an editing mode. Uh, if you want to log off the application or create a new employee. So let's start with log off. Log off is the easy one. This master app says, oh, you want to log off? Well, well we're going to show the, uh, we're going to get rid of the current employee you're actually looking at and show the login view, right? Go back to login view. You do a lot of other things here, such as uh, probably dispatch uh, uh, an application event to handle that rather than let this mediator respond to it. You want to call the logout service. You want to get rid of some local data. Maybe you want to store some things, clear some session particular data so another user could possibly log in, right? A lot more you want to do than that. For, for now, we're just going to show the login view, okay? Uh, if we want to create a new employee or an edit employee, they basically do the same thing. One, show they both show the actually edit employee view, but one of them says, oh, okay, let's give it nothing and make a temporary VO. The other says, let's give it an existing VO, and I'll show you that right now. So let's go to the edit employee view, okay? When I click on edit employee, the application event is registered by a variety of people. The one that matters first off is the application mediator. He's the one that says, all right, well, they want to edit an employee. Let's show the edit employee view. But notice it actually tells the model what the current one is, right? That was his responsibility to do that, not the actual employee view, which allowed you to click on it. 
Now you could. You could say, look, I'm I know what employee you want to edit, set it on the model, and then dispatch this for some other dude to change it. This is where you get into, you know, challenges where you might do the same thing twice in multiple mediators, right? If you do the same thing twice in two places, what do you what do you call that? Dry. Don't repeat yourself. So the way you solve that, you split those two calls into either A, a better model API to actually set that, or B, put it in a command, right, to orchestrate that application logic. For now, we let the uh, Cafe Townsend guy do it, and we say, all right, show me the edit employee view, right? So you'll actually see, again, if you can't recall, I'll go through it again. Oh, wait, we don't need to show iPad. There we go. Add in password. Login. We click on a button, it says edit this employee, and it shows the edit employee view. Remember that? Okay. So if we show the edit employee view, it'll show the edit employee view. Ooh, again, the edit employee view is just like any other view. This group has a class type for its mediator to know who it is, draws a bunch of form fields and variety of dudes on the stage, tells robot legs, hey, I'm a view, I'm created, please create a mediator if any is currently registered for me. And he dispatches certain events based on user clicking in feedback, right? Pretty standard stuff. But here's where the magic happens of sharing the same view for multiple things, right? Generic views, good APIs. We'll go to the edit employee view mediator, and you can see that he does standard stuff, listen to the user gestures, but he has an if-then statement. If we have a current employee, let's go into edit mode. Set the view with a current employee that'll show the first name and last name fields with the value that it has. The phone number field will have the value it has, and it'll load up a picture icon if, if any is there, right? Additionally, anytime you edit those fields or edit the picture, it'll update the data on that particular view you're editing, right? If you hit save, it'll actually go and save that out. Otherwise, if you have a new employee or a temporary VO, right, it'll, it'll modify that. If you don't hit save, then it won't actually save those changes. It will save the, um, the edited changes, whether you like it or not, because it's the current employee, right? So what you really should do is create a new one and put it in edit mode, maybe using a state machine or something. But anyway, this is a demo app, okay? So same view, treated two different ways based on what state the employee's model is in. Okay, employees model is the same model we've been dealing with. We only have, as you can see, in our package, one model, right? It just is an API to the employee data for getting a new ID, deleting items, saving items, updating, etc. right? Normal model stuff. Um, when you click a delete employee, it knows to dispatch an event. Let's go look. Delete employee we, is mapped to a delete employee command. Oh, I'm incorrect, it does. So let's go to the delete employee command, okay? Snags the employee from the event, right? Remember, all commands get the event and instantiated them with whatever data is there. In this case, the employee is what we wanted. Notice it sets it to self, and this is because it's going to be an asynchronous call. So we need to have context when the service comes back what employee we're talking about. It's not going to complete while this function is done, so we need to store it in a member level uh, variable, right? We call the de delete employee service. We say, all right, when you've successfully deleted this employee from the server, let me know. That way I can remove it on the client, right, and actually remove it from the user's list. If it's successful, go ahead and say, hey, we deleted that, that employee, that's successful, and um, you can redraw yourself, okay? What would be nice is this actually had the employee that deleted, so you can more efficiently redraw the list, but, or if the model dispatched that, but we don't because this is an example app, right? So just to give you a quick glimpse at the delete employee service, again, it is a fake RESTful service, right? All it is is a timer that after two seconds says, hey, no, it, it worked, right? Again, this could be a network request that hits a real um, web service, or it could hit a facade layer that not only deletes it from the service, but also deletes it from your local copy, whether it's a JSON or SQLite uh, wrapper around whatever you're doing, right? Either way, it doesn't matter. So the uh, loading dialog guy, loading view, I think it's loading view. Loading view mediator, he'll listen for that uh, on delete success, right? And show and hide the loading as appropriate, right? That's one view. The other view is the Caffeine Townsend orchestrator. If we did su successfully delete an employee, we need to get out of that view. You can't edit uh, an employee that's deleted anymore, right? So when you click the delete button on the edit employee view, which is here, right, it'll take you out. It's basically the same thing as hitting back, almost, except this particular guy's gone, right? Now, again, you have an option of not deleting. You can hit cancel, 
But if you did hit it, it would delete him and then take you out once successful. If it wasn't successful, you'd still be on the screen with a message as to why you couldn't currently delete him. Right? And again, that's the mediator's responsibility to give you that error, whatever it is. That error would come back in the delete error service. Okay? Pretty straightforward, I hope, so far. I understand this is a lot, but again, view, service, model. You can see how you're building views that are dumb. They have mediators on top of them who respond to application events. The only one who cares about global things is the, the loading view, right? So he can show and hide things. And the Cafe Townsend application view because he can orchestrate what views to show. But most views are like, you know, the uh, login view, right? Login view mediator only cares about the login view. He cares about the login error from the service, so you can tell what errors, but for the most part, that's all he cares about, right? Short, simple, to the point, edit employee view, same thing. I just want to know, hey, when you uh, delete this particular one, do it. Um, if you want to save the particular employee, I need to get an image file name, create a temporary VO, and then uh, verify it's actually saved. If it's an existing one, you're editing data, I need to call the update function rather than the saves function, right? So a little bit of business logic here that could be you know, improved on either A, put it in the command, or B, a better model API to handle those kind of changes, such as inspecting if the ID is negative one or things like that, right? But we're in a hurry, so the mediator is a quick place to do it to get her done. Maybe the API isn't even done yet. Maybe you didn't know that you needed an API for that, right? And finally, the back button touched. Uh, I hit the back button touched. Cafe Townsend application will listen for this and show the appropriate view. And renew or renege, renege all data changes, right? And that's about it. Hit back, goes back to this view, knows you don't want to actually want to change it, okay? So that's really it. That's all there is to this particular application. I mean, obviously, there's some components in here. Um, the save employee command, right, just is a gateway to the did the model save. If it did particular save, cool. The new employee was successfully saved um, to both the server and the, the model. Notice there's a service call in this case, but usually there would be. You'd actually save it to the model, right? So the command is uh, the guy who orchestrates both the service call and actually saying, all right, it was in fact good. I did update my local model. Now it's the third thing, dispatch the event that it did work. So these people who want to listen to it could. Now the debate here is why dispatch an event? If the model changed and the you know GUI respond to it? Well, yes. In most situations, that's correct. If they're built to models and they're in existence and they have a reference to it given to them by the mediator, yes, they will respond to any of these nice little events that the employee's model dispatches such as save, update, and delete. So when the data changes, they can draw. That's great. Sometimes, though, you want application-level events to orchestrate flow, such as dealing with wizards or certain set of screens like I'm showing you, for example. So it's really what you're more comfortable with. Me personally, I like uh, employees that are really, you know, like the dispatch events and you draw to them, right, and you're nice and efficient. But if you're in a hurry, this is great. <laughs> this is a great way to get her done kind of thing. Um, startup command, I just thought I'd bring this up. This is kind of a convention I do. Um, when I need a lot of models to actually get in a certain state, I usually have like a lot more than one model, obviously, right? I want to instantiate these models. I want to put them on global. I want to initialize them. I want them to load initial services to get data from the server. And then you'll notice that uh, in the context down here, where is the context? Right here. I say, hey, startup. Well, not necessarily here. A lot of times I wait for startup command to load all its data, then dispatch startup. That way I knew my app was ready to go, right? In this case, it just assumes that if you look in the Cafe Townsend app, Right. All right, I've, I've uh, instantiated myself, instantiated the context, and uh, I'm ready to go. It's like, well, wait a minute, dude. Like, you know, has the startup command gone, you know, things like that. So that's just something I like to do. Um, you'll notice that a lot of these APIs, delete, save, and update, are actually things that could have been done in the model, right? They could have been done in an API. But I chose to put them in a command because we're doing more than just a service call. This also, these commands give us an option to do SQLite calls in here. Now, one could argue that you would have a nice facade class, such as like what iOS does with the core data. So you could say, look, save the data. It'll handle saving to SQLite in the service. I don't need to worry about that. I don't need robot legs for that. That is true. You don't. If you're just learning, though, robot legs is a great uh, gateway drug to getting the core data. Okay? And other facade design pattern, blah, 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 blah. Right? Um, components. Notice components do not have anything to do with views. These components are just text field to auto-size things, the back button. They don't have mediators. 
They could have mediators, right? All they need is a class name and dispatch any robot like view created event, right? And obviously, hopefully, a removed event. But these are really, really things I put a GUI together. They're not actually the GUI itself. So that's why I put it in the components package. Uh, the actual mediators themselves go in the actual mediator, right? And you'll notice again the um, employee view mediator, even though it says right here view set employees, the employee view large and employee view have the exact same setter method. So I'll show you the employee view large. If you go to the uh, set, where is the set employees, right? Same exact API. It's a convention. There are no interfaces in Lua, but there are tons of conventions, and this is one of them, right? So that's that. Um, Robot Legs is just the library of these two classes for now. Obviously, there'll be more later. These services are the RESTful services you call. They also can include your data if you want. For now, I've just got fake uh, services in here. Read content that does actually read a local JSON file. Utility classes uh, allows you to do an event dispatcher. So if you wanted, you could actually make collection objects, which help make models easier to deal with, right? You can actually listen for a particular piece of data to change. I'll have to show you a collection someday. And view classes. These are all the views that you saw on the screen, right? The login view, the loading view that shows the little spinner, the employee view, which is mainly made for the iPhone, and the employee view large, which is made when uh, you have a tablet turned to the side. And the edit employee view, which is the same for whether phone or tablet. Right? Um, again, the, the, the one thing this application doesn't show very well is the config Lua. So it's defaulting to the iPhone size. It doesn't default to the iPad size, right? which is down here. Now you could do that, and I'll show you what that looks like. Um, this is Lua code. So you could do an if then check for the particular device and show that if you'd like. There is one. As you can see, it's already significantly smaller. The challenge is. We're not using EM text, which is uh, what a lot of the HTML people do for doing responsive design and ensure their text always looks the same regardless of device. So you'll notice admin is still huge. It doesn't shrink down to the higher resolution that it actually has available to itself. Um, something I need to do, but you notice the loading is a lot better looking, <laughs> higher resolution, right? This is another problem that Corona has in earlier builds is that the mask uh, you have to do some tricky math to say, all right, well, based on my current resolution, my mask scale should actually be this big, right? Versus, you know, this small, because I have a lot more room now, right? So that's why Corona has created a container object rather than a group, which allows you to set a specific width and height for those particular. So all that was masking woes are now gone, right? It also helps from a GPU perspective. So this will be gone, but, you know, the good news is you have a larger GUI, right? So you have a lot more room, yada, yada. But you can see it's still responsive for the most part. Um, uh, we just have some massive text issues, okay? But again, it's a work in progress. I just want to show you guys some progress on um, an example app which you can use for robot legs, right? So that's basically it. Hopefully that gives you a good idea of a simple application where you create views. You create mediators for those views. They all interact and listen for the model. They communicate through both local and application level events. The service classes handle getting the data via business logic from the back end and front end. Usually commands or potentially models or potentially mediators, depending on how you want to go about things, are capable of asking for that data, getting it, and either setting the model or giving a command that ability to set the model, right, in a true controller fashion. And somebody somewhere has to instantiate the context to wire up everything, right? Somebody somewhere has to say, all right, these are the views, these are my mediators, and these are the commands that happen. We are ready to go, right? And then somebody somewhere has to instantiate those particular models, which I like to do in the startup command, right, to get everything good to go. So those models could be created and started and interact with your, your GUI. Um, again, the only challenging thing, as you've probably seen, is the config Lua dealing with the different screen sizes designing, working with your designer to create a design that you can hopefully have the same API between those different devices and then offload a lot of that application logic to your mediator so you can save all your mediator command code and service code and uh, hopefully the only one of these packages that will change per devices is this guy, views, right? That's the hope. So if you can keep all this other code the same per devices and just change your views and config, you are kicking it live with robot legs. So. Again, my name is Jesse Ward. If you got any questions, you can hit me up on Twitter, Facebook, Google+. Uh, you can hit me up on email, jessew at webappsolution.com. My company loves to do uh, enterprise development, but uh, I've been doing some corona investigations on the side as well. Don't forget to subscribe. And uh, thanks for your time. I hope this is helpful.
And again, if you're not familiar, I've already done a large, long walkthrough of robot legs from a more high level. So if you're seeing this for the first time, you're not really sure, like, what's the point of robot legs or Corona or Lua or how does it solve? What problems are we actually solving here? What is NVC? I go over all that. So definitely check out that video as well. Oh, yeah. And uh, you might be able to get these t-shirts on eBay. Good luck with that because I'm not selling mine.